I'm going to start off with a very quick story. A year ago, I got a phone call from a guy named Al. And Al, I was told by a friend of mine, was going to give me a ring because he's with the RCMP. He's out in BC. And in BC, they're struggling with some of the smaller communities and things that they're facing. Now, my phone rang. I didn't really know much more than that. And I pick it up, and I hear this huge, booming voice on the other side. This guy, Al, he's like, Jordan. I'm like, hey. He's like, we need your help, man. I'm like, uh, OK. I, I know nothing of this guy at this point. He's like, here's the deal. Teen pregnancy, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, self-harm, all through the roof in a bunch of our communities in southern BC. We have no idea what to do. He went on to explain that all the standard measures that the RCMP were taking, going into schools, being involved in the community, doing other awareness programs, just weren't resonating. And he had this big youth summit coming up where people from all over the province were going to come together. And he asked me, he said, you're some internet researcher, tech guy, how would you tackle this? And I was like, what, what do you mean, tackle what? And he said, self-worth among our kids. So I hang up the phone, and I sit there. I'm like, that's a great question. How would anyone tackle this? And also, a little bit of imposter syndrome set in. Who was I to tackle this? What was I going to do with this? And I sat there, and I pulled in a couple friends. I gave some friends a call, and I said, what would you do with this? I called a friend of mine that's a psychotherapist, another that's a social worker, another that's a youth worker, and then some buddies of mine that work in tech. And for two weeks, I sort of sat on it. And I started to ask myself a lot of really hard questions. And before I tell you what I told Al two weeks later, I'm going to tell you the things that I was thinking about. This is me in grade eight, my grade eight graduation photo. There was color photography then. I'm not that old, OK? Now, in, by the time I was in grade 8, I really wasn't fond of myself. Because by the time I had entered grade 3 initially, I was bullied every single day. And that continued in grade 4, grade 5, grade 6, grade 7, and definitely came ahead to a head in grade 8. This face is one that was wearing a mask because I learned how to be a chameleon as a point of survival. I was still getting beat up most days, but I figured out how to get by. I figured out the right things to say and do. And as I was thinking about Al's question, I was thinking about that kid. And then I was thinking about what happened afterwards. Now, I had a very strange brush with virality on the internet. It's a funny story. It was a dare that went wrong. It was me giving away a plane ticket to the same name as someone, as same name as someone with my ex's name. And it was a way of trying to pay forward. It was not a romantic gesture. It was simply a way of trying to do something good out of heartbreak because I purchased this massive trip and I knew there were probably people out there with the exact same name that had never traveled at all in their lives. And so I gave away the ticket. The post went viral. The whole story blew up. Before I knew there was a movie in Hollywood under production and all this other crazy stuff. Now, what wasn't in the media is that I crumbled. I crumbled hard because what happened was for the first time in my life, all the validation that I dreamt of getting from social media and otherwise that we all dream of getting at some point wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to make me feel okay. It wasn't enough for me to forgive myself, the kid that was bullied. It wasn't enough for me to make sense of everything. And so feeling the shame of humiliating my ex on a world stage, feeling the pain of being associated with this bubblegum story when I knew that that wasn't me at all, I crumbled. And things got really dark. So dark, in fact, that friends of mine started to do interventions, starting to pull out the whole story of what really happened. And in a moment, without even thinking, I started to share the journey online of what was actually happening behind the virality. And as I shared some of the things that were going through my mind, other people started contacting me with their own stories. Maybe it wasn't the same kind of viral thing, but something in their lives where they felt so much shame for something they had done online, or they felt like some pain had happened in their journey that they'd never disclosed, and they felt like they too were wearing a mask. And I realized that for 20 years, I had been wearing this mask.
There was a point in time just before I got back to Al that I was thinking about what it is because it's not really traditional mental health. It's not really traditional like living with technology kind of issues. It's the fact that how we live today, all of us, from students to old people, we live where we have to constantly appeal to so many different audiences and we try so hard and we live in this fog. And so a friend and I came up with this term, a big lie, super simple, basic sounding. But we started to look at the things that were driving us mad inside. And so we define it as something immense that we hide from the world even though it significantly defines us. And I realized that I had been living a big lie since I was a kid. Because when I was a kid and when I was an adult and when I was viral on the world stage and everything in between, I said I was okay for decades when I was so far from. I tried to seek help, but I told I was just growing up and this was part of it. I tried to look into myself, but I didn't know the language. And so I wrote Al back, Al from the RCMP. And I said, hey, I have this wild idea. What if we asked the students in your communities about the lie that they're living? Let's so ask them the question, what's your big lie? What's your big lie? And not only that, we would use the same technology that was driving us nuts in the first place to get them to answer it. So we created a smartphone platform where people in the audience like you guys could share anything and it would not be traceable back to you. It would just pop up on screens in real time. The second you hit submit, it would go up. So all of a sudden, what we would be able to do is ask questions about the lie that we're, that we're living the pain that we're holding inside, what's keeping us up at night, and also the positive questions, like how we fight through it, what we tell ourselves, how we're resilient. I wrote it all up, I sent it to Al, and my last line in that email was, I know this is a little crazy, but what do you think? He emailed back within two minutes. Jordan, I love it. Two weeks later, I was standing in front of audiences in BC. Now, over three days, we spoke to 3,000 students between grade seven and nine. And I had no idea how this was gonna go. This was just an idea. And I was really nervous up there. I mean, just before the first time we ever did this, I was thinking, my goodness, either this is gonna work and be amazing, or it's gonna crash and burn. And so I start telling a story. I start telling some of the earliest things that I remember from the moments I was bullied and the moment that I realized that I was struggling with depression and anxiety, the moments that I held on to and attached so much shame all the way through my viral experience and how much guilt and shame I felt for how I had humiliated so many other people, never mind myself. And I asked the audience, all right, guys, let's be real. Pull out your phones. Let's hear it. What's the lie you're living? What's something immense inside you? What's something immense that's happened to you that you know shapes how you are, but you don't tell anyone? And the responses came in within seconds. And I'm looking at them on my phone, and I'm stunned. The, one of the first responses I see is that my dad beats me at home, and I'm scared to ask for help. The next one was that I think my sister is pregnant, and she can't tell anyone. The next one is, my mom's addicted to drugs. The next one is, I use alcohol to numb my pain. It's a grade seven, grade seven. And so they go up, we're looking at them. Then we ask more questions. We ask how they remind themselves that they matter in those dark moments. And amazing messages come in. I remember that I'm loved. I remember that people need me. I remember that I have so much more to offer to this world. And we're looking at all this trickle in, okay? I'm standing up there being like, Oh man, I can't believe this is working. But also stunned by the honesty, stunned by the vulnerability. And I could see all the teachers and the guidance counselors and the RCMP officers in the back of the room with their eyes wide being like, oh. Then I did something that was off script and it changed the course of all of this. We had a little bit of time left in the first session. I went to the audience and I said, guys, no pressure. No pressure at all but we've seen how we're feeling. We've just proven that you are not alone. You can see that so many other people in this room, we don't know who you are, but you're feeling some of these things. Would anyone like to come forward and share their story? 
Grab the microphone. You don't have to share it all. You don't overshare. Just come up here if you want and share a bit of what you've been through and how you've done it. No one puts their hand up, of course. <laughs> but then I give it a couple seconds, and I see a hand sheepishly go up in the back. And I kind of say, you there, is that a hand? And the hand goes down, and it snakes back up a second later. This grade seven girl stands up. She walks up to the stage with a sense of determination in her stride that I'll never forget. And she's walking up, my heart is pounding, being like, man, this is either gonna go really well or so bad. And she grabs the mic, I whisper in her ear, are you sure you wanna do this? And she looks at me and she says, yeah. She grabs the microphone. And I'm not gonna tell you exactly what she said because these sessions are very special. And we have a bit of a cone of silence, but here were the, here were the highlights. She shared a journey about something that happened when she was very young, where she was made to do something terrible to one of her friends by a relative. And she had lived with that for so many years. She, just a year earlier, tried to tell her family, and they didn't believe her. Then she tried to tell her friends for more support, and they started teasing her. And she said in front of all of us that she, don't, she doesn't know how she's going to hold on. But the only thing that's keeping her going is the realization that if she weren't around a lot of other people that she takes care of wouldn't be either. As she finishes up, she releases a whimper. And instantly, there's a standing ovation of all 500 students in that room. The first three rows come up and maul her. They're all over her, they're hugging her. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And then five other students came up afterwards and did the exact same thing. At the end of it, I ran up to her with a guidance counselor in tow at that. I ran up to her and said, oh my God, that was amazing. You just took the mask off. You just, how, whoa, how are you? And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I just had verbal diarrhea. I was just asking so many questions. I'm like, like what, what was going through your mind? Blah, 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 blah. And she's like, stop. And she looked at me dead in the eyes. And she said, today was the first time in my life that I was validated. The first time in my life I was validated. Direct quote. Imagine the gravity of that moment. Because for once, for once, she had the opportunity to share what was really going on and to correct the narrative that had been eating away at her for so long. And not only that, her friends, and her friends witnessed her, her peers witnessed her as she really is, and they saw that beauty and bravery. It was a second later, I was pulled aside by a superintendent that was there from the board. And they said, that wasn't our students. Not our students. You faked that. You faked all those submissions. You must have put her up to sharing that. You must have put all those students up for sharing that. That wasn't real. Our students don't feel like that. And I looked at her. And my new buddy, Al, was right next to me, too. And we said, oh, no, it's real. And I showed her. I pulled over my laptop, and I showed her exactly how the platform works. Showed her exactly all the submissions that had come in. I showed her how they're logged in a database, how we don't know their identifiable information, but how we know they came from this room right here, right now. And she was flustered. She walked away. I've heard this countless times because what's happened since that experience, this thing, this program called What's Your Big Lie has blown up, not just in Canada, but across the US. I now have spoken to over 100,000 people in a year that have shared their most intimate pain anonymously. Now, it's not just students, okay? It's not just students at all. It's not just middle school students. It's not just high school students. I'm going to share you some submissions from elementary students. When we work with elementary students, we don't ask the question, what's your big lie? We ask, what's your big truth? We ask about sense of identity, how they see themselves, how others see them, and what's going through their minds. And instead of using technology, we just hand out cue cards. And I'll have the students spread all over a gym, and I'll ask them a bunch of questions. You know, what's on your mind a lot? What's keeping you up at night? What's something that you think you've told someone that may not be true about you? And they start writing notes, okay? I'm going to show you a handful from a grade five group three months ago, right here in Ontario, okay? I'm doing well, okay? I'm doing well, this idea that I'm doing well. Now, they meant it in this context that I lie about doing well, because I'm not. I lie about being happy. Now, in fairness, I did ask the students to mask their handwriting. 
because that would otherwise be the most terrifying handwriting imaginable. <laughs> My big lies, I have a huge crush on the guy, and my, if I talk to him, he'll tell me no from a desperate girl. I think we've all been a little desperate before. I think it happens to all of us. So we see cute things too, okay? We've got to focus on the light here. I love this one. But then we get this, same group, grade five. I feel like dying every day. Or I don't face my fires, and I bottle up my emotions. Or this one. My lie is that I'm in control, I'm not. My heart and soul are a blank slate. I am essentially whatever you think I am. Some part of me isn't okay with this. I know that, but is that part of me even real? Great five. I'm scared to ask for help. I'm transgender and I don't know how to tell my family. I tried to tell my mom and she still doesn't understand. I play the role of such a nice, peaceful person when in actuality I feel like a monster. Grade five feels like a monster, or this. Now, I'm not putting this up here for shock value. I'm putting this up here because I see this so often that it scares me. This is not a one-off. This is a regular occurrence. I've gotten the same notes from students as young as grade four. I've met grade five students that have self-harmed en masse. Can someone please explain to me why we are living in a culture where this is a reality for a grade five student? It's terrifying. No one should feel like this. But this is what's really going on. And we have to stare it in the eye. Now, moving on from students, we do work with parents and teachers. I did a session with some high school teachers recently, and I asked them about the lie that they're living as a parent. What's going on? What haven't you shared with your son or daughter? What haven't you shared with your parents or your peers that are also parents? They shared things like this. This is a direct screenshot off of the platform, okay? I'm afraid of failing my children, that I was sexually abused as a child, that I'm really tired, that I care too much about what other people think, that if I leave my husband, I'll be a nobody, or that I drink and get high to numb my pain. Parents, high school kids. Or this, we also do work with teachers. When we work with teachers and parents it's not, and students, it's not just about blowing it open. It's also about figuring out solutions of how we can be more real. So we break up people into working groups afterwards where they share a little bit and they come up with innovative solutions to how they can support each other better. This was from a group of high school teachers I was with just recently. I asked them, what's keeping you up at night right now? What's keeping you up at night right now? They said, I'm not really teaching anything that I'm being judged by coworkers and administration, that I'm forcing myself to drive to work and try to smile. I'm always on edge and I hate it. Or this last one, which is a real mic drop. What's keeping me up at night is I'm not raising kids and students that are hardworking, responsible, and intelligent citizens. Boom. This is the real stuff, guys. This is what we hide. This is what we work fervently to keep away from the world. I'm going to show you a couple more. Now, we do a lot of work with colleges. And one thing that we start to do is create art out of these statements. So we project them as they come in on different surfaces in the school, and we photograph them. These are some of my favorites from a recent run I just came back from. I just finished seven weeks of events all over North America. And this is some of the most profound stuff that college students share that I hope to heal someday, don't we all? That my siblings used to beat me nearly every day and my mother never believed me. She still doesn't. I was molested when I was really young and I didn't tell anyone because I didn't want to tear apart my family any farther. My boyfriend for six years loves me wants to marry me. I said yes, but I'm not in love with him. I'm afraid to leave him. I think I'm becoming anorexic, but I don't care enough about myself to change anything. Or this one, which summarizes all of this very succinctly. But my big lie is I've kept secrets about my mental health, sexuality, and everything because I'm afraid of hurting the people I care about. Here's the honest truth. We're all in on this. 
We all have something. It doesn't matter if you're a child or a senior executive. And I've done this with every segment of the population you can imagine. We're all hiding something. I've had, in these sessions, these remarkable moments of bravery where, for example, I was in San Bernardino, California a couple weeks ago, obviously the site of a huge amount of tragedy over the last year and a bit. And I was speaking at, at California State University there, and I opened up the floor for people to share. And a young woman came up and sort of sat next to me, just sat right here. We always keep it pretty cash. She sits down next to me, and I say, so what's going on? And she looks at me, and she's tearing up a bit, and she says, I'm worried about my mom. I said, well, what's going on with your mom? And she's like, well, my mom's a drug addict. I can't help her anymore. Now she's homeless. She doesn't want to live with me. She doesn't want to live with family. She wants to be on the street. But now she's been diagnosed with cancer. And any time that I have to take her to an appointment, I have to leave two hours early and drive around the streets of my own city to try to find her. She doesn't have a phone. And then, in the second row, a young woman stood up and said, I moved away from home because my mom was doing the exact same thing. My mom also was homeless. And I had to find her when I needed something from her or when she needed care. And then, if you can believe it, a third person stood up closer to the back of the room. And he said that his father was just out of an addiction center and they couldn't find him. So what do you think happens in that moment? Obviously, as we're sitting here, and these two brave individuals are sharing as well, we're obviously all in tears, for starters. I mean, come on. But beyond that, and more importantly, the three of them have since formed a support group where they figure out how they can better support each other and their family members and other students that may be experiencing the same thing. And that's a very niche example. We've had other students come up and declare that they don't necessarily identify with their birth gender. We've had other students come up and share incredible moments of bravery, of overcoming immense amount of pain from a family member leaving or a death. We've had we have had people and students of all ages apologize for being bullies to their entire schools or apologize to their exes for being emotionally abusive. We've had people that have simply declared that they never knew until this moment that they weren't alone and then do amazing things with it. Look, I'm not here saying that we figured out anything particularly remarkable. All that we've done is we've used technology as a way to open up very, very real, authentic, in-person conversations. But this is what pains me. This is what pains me. We've seen enormous traction and validation that this works. Yet this is what I hear all too often from people that are in charge at companies, at schools, colleges, universities, organizations that don't want to look. One passage I circle there, it says, we also cannot monitor the impact which our students may be triggered due to mental health challenges. The lie framework doesn't resonate well given the stage of identity development that should be normalized. So in plain speak, what that means is the lie concept is a little too out there. But what we've learned, and this was an accident, but what we've learned is this idea of a lie is something that we can all identify with, whether we have mental health challenges or not. Sometimes we just feel lonely and vulnerable. Sometimes we feel like there's an immense amount of pressure and we have to be wearing a mask, that we have to be faking it. So we get turned down a lot. We're told by people that this is too much. But those people are not the ones in the audience. Those people are not the students that are having these incredible moments. And yeah, look, at the end of the day, we should be always striving for this. We should always plan for the most vulnerable person in any room. But here's what I've learned. And here's what many of you, I'm sure, that have done any kind of this work, or many of you guys that are involved in different clubs that do some of this kind of stuff, we don't know who the most vulnerable person is in the room. We just don't. So culturally, what we do is we try to step silently around these issues and keep the pain that we're holding inside within this traditional framework of 
counselors, and therapists, which are enormously important and part of the solution. But what that does is it means that people can never open up and share themselves. And what that means is that if people can't open up and share themselves, then they're going to consistently, for so many years beyond being in this room right here, right now, be hiding. And that impacts so much pain. And what I'm seeing is this fear of the reality, when really the reality is so beautiful. From our habits to the systems that we organize ourselves in, from the little things that we do every single day, the little white lies we tell, we're making ourselves feel more alone. And that's not a way to be, it's not a way that we can sustain. We just can't. There are record rates of depression and anxiety among all segments of the population. Self-harm is going through the roof. We're seeing grade five students share incredible amounts of pain. So what's the alternative? The truth is nothing to be afraid of because it's only when people start to have these real interactions and see how we really are that we can feel less alone. And when we feel less alone, we feel more confident that what we're feeling is appropriate. We start trusting ourselves. In fact, there's a huge amount of psychological research that's been done that shows that if you are living a lie, you are in a constant state of fight or flight. What that means is that you're on edge. Paying attention is really hard. Rational judgment is nearly impossible. You're far more prone to depression and anxiety. Yet every person I've met in the last year is hiding something. So what's that doing to us? The solution is not a program. The solution is not a workshop series. The solution is not a TED Talk. The solution is not any of these things. The solution is our everyday interactions. Our everyday interactions where we see our peers, our friends, our family members all holding something in. We have the opportunity every day to lean in and say, what's really going on? How are you? And maybe it won't be that moment that changes someone's life, but if that happens enough times, it will. So it's all in all of us. And if you think about it, on the upside, what a cool opportunity. What a cool opportunity to know that no matter what's going on in your life, that you are not the only one. But maybe, just maybe, by opening up, not only will you empower others, not only will you empower others, but you'll prevent so much pain. Isn't that something to think about? So what are you guys going to do? As you go on through the rest of the day, it's something to think about. And I hope this message leaves with you beyond these walls because I can assure you, no matter how you feel sometimes, you are not the only one feeling that way. Thank you very much.